Before we begin, we'd like to give special thanks to all of our sponsors for making this event possible each year. Specifically, thank you to CRL FormFox for being our title sponsor for six consecutive years. And thank you to our platinum sponsors, Psychmedics, Orsure Technologies, Quest Diagnostics, and Veriforce. Hi, and thank you so much for joining us for another session of Day with DISA. This session is a transportation industry update, and we're focused on the clearinghouse and DOT. Today, we're joined by Brian Price, the Chief of Drug and Alcohol Programs at the FMCSA, and Stacy Johnson, Transportation Specialist at the FMCSA. Brian, Stacy, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having us. Great. Thanks for having us today. Absolutely. It's it's our pleasure. And, and frankly, we're, we're lucky to have you guys here. So thank you for making time. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, I want to remind everyone of a couple quick things. If you have any questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom right of the player. And if we're unable to answer your specific question today, we'll reach out to you after day with DISA. Additionally, we'll make a copy of the presentation available for download on the materials tab at the end of the session. With that being said, Brian, Stacy, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you for having us today. Um, I'm Brian Price, Chief of Drug and Alcohol Programs Division at the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And with me today, I have Stacy Johnson, a transportation specialist within our division uh, who works extensively within the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. Um, we're going to touch on several topics today. We always like to give just a little bit of background about the Clearinghouse. We're going to touch on some recent enhancements we've made uh, based on user feedback for the motor carrier industry. We'll touch on some statistics, uh, give an update on a Clearinghouse 2 rule that's going to be going into effect in November of this year. Talk a little bit about uh, how the Clearinghouse has impacted FMCSA operations, both administratively and from an enforcement standpoint and then touch on some common questions we receive. Okay, as far as background, uh, one of the things we always like to make clear and point out is that the clearinghouse itself uh, is not something that we dreamed up on our own at FMCSA. It's something that was mandated by Congress, uh, frankly, based on uh, industry support. Uh, back in MAP 21. Uh, we published a regulation uh, that was implemented in January of 2020. So the clearinghouse itself has been up and running almost exactly four full calendar years now. Uh, there's a second rule uh, that's going to go into effect in November of this year that we'll talk a little bit about later, but it's effectively going to, to tie a driver's uh, status in the clearinghouse, in other words, whether or not they're prohibited based on a violation, with their actual CDL status at the state DMV level. Okay, again, just by way of background, I think uh, most are at least familiar with what the clearinghouse is, but again, we like to provide a little bit of background just to provide a framework for some of these discussions. But basically, uh, the Clearinghouse is a, a, a federal repository where CDL licensed drivers, drug and alcohol testing violations are reported to us at the federal level. Uh, and with that, uh, of course, we're looking at uh, verified positive tests reported by medical review officers, uh, alcohol and tests greater than 0.04 and refusals reported by employers those kinds of violations. And the general premise of this clearinghouse is that uh, when employers are hiring a commercial driver, they do a pre-employment check to make sure the driver doesn't have an unresolved violation. In other words, that the driver has completed the return to duty process if they're required to do that. Uh, the other clearing kind of basic clearinghouse requirement in addition to the pre-employment requirement is that at least once a year, um, 
employing motor carriers are required to do annual queries. In other words, check the clearinghouse uh, to make sure that none of the drivers on their driver roster have an unresolved violation. Okay, I'm gonna to touch on some of the system enhancements real quick. And these have been in effect uh, for a little over eight months now. Uh, back in March of 2023, we implemented what we refer to as the 12 month look back query notification. And basically what this means is if an employee and motor carrier uh, does a query on an individual driver, let's say on April 1st of this year, if anything new is added to that driver's record over the next 12 months, so from April 1st of this year until April 1st of 2025, that employer is going to get an email notification saying, hey, this driver of yours that you queried back in April, they've got something new added to their clearinghouse record. Now, the reason this was important is we were hearing from the motor carrier industry saying, you know what? The clearinghouse is working great, but I hired this driver in April. Uh, I did my annual queries in December, and I found out that that driver, while he was working for me, he thought he was going to get a little better pay at another company. He went over and did a pre-employment test with them and tested positive. I knew nothing about it. Um, so what that's a gap, if you will, that this new 12 month look back query notification plugs the hole, so to speak. So now, uh, if you have a driver or an employer has a driver that sneaks off and tests somewhere else and tests positive, if you queried them in the last 12 months, you're going to get an email notification that something new has been added to their record. Another enhancement we made, um, th and this one was based uh, largely on feedback from our field staff. Uh, but as part of their compliance investigation activities, they would go into an employee and motor carrier and they would start looking at the drug and alcohol testing records. And a real common thing they were seeing is that uh, maybe a driver wasn't prohibited. They had tested positive in the past. They had gone through the return to duty process, had seen a substance abuse professional, been cleared and tested negative on the return to duty test but the employers were dropping the ball on ensuring the follow-up tests uh, recommended by the SAP being completed. So we just added a little alert symbol there. Um, it's a small thing, but it's designed to try and get employers attention a little better that uh, a driver on your roster, just because they're not prohibited, doesn't mean they don't have follow-up tests that need to be conducted. Okay, from a statistics standpoint, um, just to give you an idea of sort of um, some of the things we're seeing in terms of numbers. Again, we've had the clearinghouse up and running uh, four full calendar years now. Um, and you can see there are all kinds of different stakeholders involved in the drug and alcohol testing community involved, including substance abuse professionals, MROs, consortiums, third-party administrators. And you can see here, um, we've got over 2,000 CTPAs registered this year alone, uh, and you can see uh, the, the various stakeholders uh, that have registered and are using the clearinghouse. It's just an indicator of how widespread the use is across the country. By the same token, uh, one of the things that we look at as kind of a gauge as to how comprehensively the motor carrier industry are, are using the clearinghouse to query their drivers and make sure they don't have unresolved violations. Uh, we're up to over 5.2 million unique commercial driver's license that have been queried. So that's just a, an indicator to us that by and large, um, the motor carrier industry is doing a pretty good job of, of checking the clearinghouse to make sure their CDL drivers um, aren't prohibited, don't have an unresolved drug or alcohol violation. The types of violations that we see, um, this is kind of summary data. And by the way, all this information is publicly available on our clearinghouse.dot.gov website. 
Uh, but this just gives you a sense for uh, the volume of violations that are being reported. Unfortunately, the 2023 data is just through uh, December 1st. Uh, we don't have the full calendar year yet, but you can see we're right on track to see a general uptick in violations uh, being reported to the clearinghouse year over year. On the drug side, the vast majority are positive drug tests. But one of the things that's concerning to us is that we also see uh, a substantial uh, number of refusals to test reported to the clearinghouse. And of course, we're always quick to try and advise drivers that the, uh, the consequences of these refusals to test are the exact same as if the driver had tested positive. Uh, one of the questions we often get is what kind of drug violation data are we seeing? Um, obviously, no surprise to many people anyway. Uh, marijuana is uh, far and away the most common substance we see identified in positive drug tests. However, a point I always make is that when you, you kind of dig down into this data, um, four out of 10 positive tests, in other words, basically 40% of the positive tests reported to the clearinghouse contain substances other than marijuana. And I make that point because oftentimes we, we hear an impression uh, publicly that this is prob that the clearinghouse is just all marijuana positives and not much else. And that's clearly not the case. Uh, in terms of individual driver status, uh, you can see the numbers here. Currently, nationwide, they're right at 156,000 drivers that are prohibited in the clearinghouse. Um, and you can see the numbers there. One thing that we've noticed is that uh, basically three out of four of those prohibited drivers, 100 and, almost 119,000, haven't started the return to duty process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in relation to the Clearinghouse 2 rule. Okay, the Clearinghouse 2 rule, what is that? Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's basically a new rule. It's effective November of 2024. And it's essentially going to tie our federal clearinghouse database with all the state DMVs. And so what the state DMVs are going to do is if a driver is prohibited in the clearinghouse, they're required to downgrade that driver's status at the state level, their CDL status. So their actual license will be downgraded. Uh, this is gonna be uh, impactful in a couple of ways. Uh, for example, we know, and, and Stacy's gonna talk about this a little bit, there are drivers that are on the road that are not supposed to be. By implementing this rule, it's going to um, help us uh, remove those drivers from the road because with the, the license suspended, even if the even if the company isn't checking the clearinghouse like they're supposed to, we know their insurance company will be checking that driver's license status before they allow them uh, to be an insured driver. So we think this rule is going to be impactful in driving, no pun intended, driving more drivers into that return to duty process. Uh, so it's gonna increase demand for SAP services, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy, and she's gonna talk about um, some of the administrative functions of the clearinghouse, what we're seeing from an enforcement standpoint and get into some of our common questions and answers. Thanks, Brian, I appreciate it. So we're just gonna take a minute or two and talk about how the clearinghouse ties into FMCSA as a whole um, and how it relates to our field staff. So what we have here is we just wanted to bring your attention to some of the tasks that we're completing on a daily basis. So the regulations do allow for drivers to petition their violation in the clearinghouse. Um, to be clear, it does not allow them to petition an MRO verified positive result, nor does it allow them to petition a refusal to test. Um, it's really to help clean up any inaccuracies 
in that were reported to the clearinghouse. So we do receive between 150 of and 200 petitions weekly. And some of the petitions we might see is a duplicate violation. So an MRO goes ahead and reports a positive drug test, and then the driver requests a split sample. That split sample is then reconfirmed at lab B, is verified by the next MRO, and that MRO reports it to the clearinghouse. So that is a duplicate because it is the same specimen being tested. We will go ahead and we will remove that second reported positive because it is a duplicate of the original, uh, the original test. We'll receive petitions from drivers saying, hey, I see that you know, there's a violation on my clearinghouse. However, I had a prescription for that. We then refer that driver, we dismiss their petition and we refer that driver back to the MRO because the MRO is the entity that would review that petition. So we do answer those. And then if a driver is not satisfied with their response, there is an option for an administrative review where they can appeal that decision. We receive about five to 10 of those weekly. Um, and they are a little more involved. We kind of dig a little deeper into that information. And there are additional layers of approval with that administrative review. The last bite of the apple is what we consider um, our Privacy Act review. And again, those are much more involved and they read Re do require multiple levels of approval before our, that decision goes out. And we get about one of those a week right now. We have our call center and they are receiving emails from customers. So those are drivers, SAPs, employers, um, and they also receive calls as well. And they see anywhere between 800 calls and 150 emails a day. Most of those they can resolve on their own. Uh, the wait times are typically under five minutes is what we see. Sometimes we even see as little as three minutes um, to get a response. And they're resolving most of them at the customer service level. About 50 of those a day are escalated and elevated um, to our team here in headquarters. And that is account mergers. And we, we ask that those are done by us because they can't be reversed. Um, if a driver wants to change a SAP, those can only be done in very limited circumstances. So we like to review those at our level um, and resolve them as they come in as well. We get delete requests from MROs and employers. So an MRO goes ahead and they report a positive drug test. The driver later comes back and says, here's my prescription, please validate it. MRO validates it. The MRO then requests that that positive drug test, test is deleted from the clearinghouse. So that request is sent to us. We will review it and respond appropriately. So we get um, about 100 of those weekly. Um, the numbers fluctuate, but that's a good average. Return to duty and follow-up delete requests. We get about 50 of those weekly. And that's a circumstance where an employer says, hey, that was actually done as a pre-employment, not as a return to duty. So it wasn't done under direct observation, doesn't meet the regulations, and we need to go ahead and remove that return to duty. Or with the follow-up, we want the completion of the follow-up testing plan. Um, and some employers don't understand, and they go ahead and they start reporting every follow-up test. So we need to go ahead and delete those follow-up tests because we only want them to report to us the completion. So again, those come to us, we review them, and then respond appropriately. SAP change requests, again, um, we don't want drivers out there SAP shopping, but there are limited cases where a SAP can be removed and a driver can change their SAP. Um, to give you a couple examples, there may be a SAP who has retired and they no longer want to um, you know, be involved in the DOT SAP process and they may have done an initial assessment on a driver, driver never went back, driver now decides they want to restart the process. We need to remove that retired SAP from their dashboard so they can go ahead and they can designate a new SAP. Um, there are sometimes location issues where a driver has moved and the SAP they have is no longer um, able to treat them because they're in a different state and their license doesn't allow them to do that. So we go ahead and we reach out to the SAP and we get more information and we confirm the information that the driver pro uh, 
presents to us. And we really investigate that out before we do allow them to change SAPs. Um, we have our clearinghouse public inbox and that is clearinghouse at dot.gov. And we receive about 90 emails or so a day. Uh, beginning of the year is always a busier time. People are doing, uh, employers are conducting their annual uh, queries that are required. And we get a lot more emails around this time of year. And then something that's fairly new, it's been around for about two months or so, is our SDLA dedicated clearinghouse inbox um, for the clearinghouse two rule. So we're probably receiving less than a dozen of emails a day in that inbox, but that's solely used by our state driver license agency. So our DMVs, our BMVs, our RMVs, um, they're the ones that are using that. So as you can see, uh, we're quite busy here. Um, we have a small team, so um, we do appreciate your patience. I know sometimes you don't get the responses as quickly as you would like, but we are working really hard to resolve the issues that are brought to us. So one of the things we do with the data is not only ensure that our drivers are not prohibited and they're following their return to duty process, but we take that data and we really merge it with our roadside inspection information. And we want to identify companies and motor carriers that are using drivers that are in a prohibited status. So we do ha have investigations being conducted nationally. And we have found that there is a link between the clearinghouse compliance and prohibited driver use. So again, Brian mentioned that we increased uh, last March to a 12 month look back. And that has really helped employers who are out there trying to do the right thing and that are running their queries because they don't want prohibited drivers on the road either. That has really helped them comply. Um, so we're seeing that on a, through our roadside inspections that drivers that are prohibited are not being, um, not being utilized and our roadside inspectors are able to ensure that prohibited drivers are not on the road. Um, when our investigators do go in there and conduct their reviews, there are civil fines that are being levied against these motor carriers. Um, it also helps us uh, review the compliance of our third party agents. So we rely heavily on SAPs and MROs and CTPAs to be out there, you know, implementing the program and the regulations that are laid out. Um, and through the investigations, we have found SAPs that are not compliant. They may need a little bit of education to get them back on the right path. Um, or there are SAPs that we have determined are not willing to comply with the regulations that you know, we have determined that are not qualified to act as a substance abuse professional. And the same thing with our CTPAs and our collection sites. So we do have investigators out there conducting these reviews. And we have found, um, you know, we have been referred these reviews by our safety investigators and also through driver complaints. So one of the unintended consequences of the clearinghouse was the increased need for these service agent reviews. Pre-clearinghouse, which was basically pre-COVID, we were doing many of these collection site reviews. We were going in person and we were either reviewing collection sites, doing an actual collection on a DOT regulated operator, or we were asking them to do a mock review. So we, we would go in there and say, okay, pretend I was a driver who came to you for a random drug test. How would you process me? And we would go through a mock collection. Um, during COVID, because we could not be out there at the collection sites, uh, those kind of dwindled, but it did allow us some time to do MRO reviews, substance abuse professional reviews, as well as um, CTP reviews. And they have really ramped up. And since... Um, you know, the world has kind of reopened and we have been able to get back out there in the field and those facilities have let us back in. We have been going back and doing those collection site reviews. But that's really important to ensure the due process to the driver and ensure the integrity in the whole process um, to ensure that that collection is being done properly from the time that driver walks through the door all the way through the collection to the lab, to the MRO, and then through the return to duty process in that substance abuse professional. So 
We do have a select number of investigators throughout the country that are qualified. They have gone through training and ongoing training and education to conduct these reviews. Um, and our, our goal really is to educate and train more of our investigators. We actually do have a class scheduled for February. We're going to have um, some state and federal investigators in there. And after the class, they'll get some on the job training and they will be out there and be able to do that. Because again, we want to ensure to the best of our ability, the integrity of this whole process to ensure that we are keeping the prohibited drivers off the road, but to ensure that we're identifying the correct drivers that should be prohibited. So we're just gonna take um, some time and go over some of the common questions that we do get through the clearinghouse and that our customer service center gets. And one of the big ones is medical marijuana. So we'll get petitions or questions saying like, I have this medical marijuana card. I don't understand why I have a positive drug test on my dashboard. Um, and as we know, there are um, over three dozen states who do have laws that allow, you know, marijuana for medical use. And we have about two dozen, maybe just over two dozen states that do allow for marijuana use for recreational purposes. Um, the federal government does not recognize marijuana use for medical or non-medical reasons. So if your drug test does come back positive for THC, it is a verified positive result and there's no exception for either recreational or medical use, regardless of which state you're in. So some more questions that we get um, about TPAs. Can you designate more than one TPA in the clearinghouse? And the answer is yes, you can. We have plenty of employers who use the company that runs their random program to report violations on their behalf and report return to duty uh, negatives on their behalf. And then they have a separate consultant who may run their annual queries for them. So when an employer designates their CTPAs, there's three options, uh, queries, return to duties, and violations. And they just check the box for who's going to be uh, allowed to do which tasks for them in the clearinghouse. Can employers register their drivers in the clearinghouse? And while we encourage you to help them, especially for some of those drivers that aren't as literate with um, the software, we do want you to help them get them. We do want you to help get them registered, but we don't want you to register for them. They really should be in there um, using their own email address and picking their own password because when they do move on from your employment, we want them to still have access to their clearinghouse. And then they need to be the ones to provide that consent. We don't want you logging in and providing that consent on their behalf. Um, how long do violations re are? How long do they remain in the clearinghouse? It's five years um, from the date of violation, unless the return to duty process and follow up testing is not completed. And at that point, it stays in there indefinitely. So we do have drivers who have violations in early 2000 saying like, okay, my time's almost up, um, but they haven't even started the process yet. And if that's the case, it's going to stay in there over the five years unless that process is completed by then. So, and that allows for future employers to be able to check to ensure that process has been completed. Can CTPAs purchase queries on the behalf of employers? So um, Brian and I and other members of our team have been out there and we've traveled over the past year or so um, to different conferences. And I've heard from CTPAs that you want this. Um, unfortunately, right now, the system is not set up that way and doesn't allow for that. So we do know that it's, it's a request that has been provided to us. Um, but at this point, employers need to purchase their own queries. They purchase it with their credit card. And then when they check the box to for a CTPA to be allowed to perform queries on their uh, queries on their behalf, you can then use the queries that they have purchased. Will the follow-up plan be available in the clearinghouse? It is not. So the SAP is not required to enter that follow-up plan into the clearinghouse, they are only required to enter the initial assessment date and the date that the driver is eligible for a return to duty test. Those follow-up plans can be amended by the SAP if needed. Um, we know that there's no more than six 
there's no less than six and 12 months, but there can be more that are prescribed up to five years. Um, so those are not in the clearinghouse and they're not tracked in the clearinghouse. We don't have employers reporting each individual test to us. We only have them reporting the date that that plan is completed with that last follow-up test. Can FMCSA remove a positive drug test violation based on a driver's prescription? We do not. Um, what happens is the driver provides that prescription to the MRO. The MRO then validates that prescription and they determine whether or not that violation needs to be removed. If they determine that it does need to be removed due to that medical explanation, they send us a request and we go ahead and approve it. And that violation is removed from the driver's dashboard. Should an MRO or employer report to the clearinghouse the results of a test conducted under the authority of another DOT agency? And the answer is no. So only violations for tests that were conducted under Part 382 are reported to the clearinghouse. And the federal CCF will, will specify which DOT agency, whether it was done under FTA, FRA, or FMCSA, and whichever, you know, if FMCSA is checked off, then those violations are reported to the clearinghouse. So that is all we have. So we just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day um, and have us here to go over our information and we can take any questions. Guys, that was great. Thank you so much for, again, being here today. So some questions from the audience. Um, uh, is CBD a valid reason for the MRO to change a THC positive to a negative? I'll take that one. Um, it is not. So there are a lot of CBD oil, CBD lotions out there. The test that is conducted is testing for THC. So if it comes back with a laboratory uh, positive for THC, the MRO is going to go ahead and review it and validate that and verify it positive. And a driver's, um, you know, if a driver comes and says, well, I'm using this the CBD oils or whatever, um, that's not a valid reason. So those will remain being positive. Gotcha. And I know uh, with CBD specifically, it is kind of buyer beware because it's not FDA regulated, not tested. There's no. Correct. You know, and we, we do content. have that notice on our website. It's also on Odapsy's website. So it is out there. But yeah, we do want to really stress the fact it is buyer beware. I know that's um, sometimes recommended by doctors. So, you know, it is important that your doctor does know what your occupation is and what the regulations are um, before you do use any of those products. For sure. Um, we've heard a lot about fentanyl this week. So one of the questions is why doesn't the DOT test for fentanyl? Uh, I can take that one. Uh, well, basically under our DOT federal drug testing programs, we're bound by the panel of drugs established by the Department of Health and Human Services for the federal um, drug testing programs. Uh, I will say, however, though, that uh, Health and Human Services has recently proposed adding fentanyl to the, the, the panel, uh, so it may be coming. I think the comment period just ended uh, January 4th or something like that. So it's it's in the works uh, from a, a public comment perspective, uh, but it's not currently there yet. We're again we're dependent on what HHS decides in that regard. Gotcha. Um, I'm a motor carrier. Oral fluid was approved. Why can't I test with oral fluid yet? Okay. Um... We've heard a lot of great things. You know, employers are really excited about oral fluid, um, especially when it comes to return to duty and follow-ups, reasonable suspicion, because basically every test is under direct observation, right? So there's a lot less chance for adulteration substitution. Um, the reason why you can't do it is because we don't have any labs that are certified yet. So we do need to have two labs because drivers still have the right to ask for their split sample to be tested. And as you know, whenever that's done, it needs to go to a separate laboratory for that second sample. So we're still waiting for those two labs to be certified. Gotcha. Um, if I'm using the clearinghouse, do I still need to do a previous employer check? I can take that one if you want, Brian. Sure. 
Um, and the answer is yes, you do. So the regulations do have a requirement for two separate types of background checks when you're hiring a driver. So there's your safety performance check, and then there's your drug and alcohol check. So the safety performance check is required for any driver operating a CMV of 10,001 pounds or greater. The pre uh, the drug and alcohol check doesn't kick in until you hit the 26,001. So you still need to do um, that safety performance check because uh, it's required for anybody that's even non-CDL, but also because the clearinghouse is only gonna have drug and alcohol violations in there. And that safety performance check is gonna ask about um, traffic citations. It's going to ask about um, crashes and then also gives that time period. So you can see if there's any gaps in their employment history. Gotcha. Um, and then last question, I know we're a little tight on time. Uh, when do you think oral fluid testing might be available? I can take that. I mean, it, it it's a speculation game at this point, but what we have heard from Health and Human Services and other ones that certify the labs is that there is significant interest. Um, I will put a timeline on it, but I would be personally surprised if we don't see it sometime in calendar year 2024. Awesome. Well, hey, Brian, Stacy, again, thank you so much for being here today, uh, spending a little bit of your time with us. It's extremely valuable and appreciated. Our pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. And again, thank you to everyone else that attended another session with David D. So we hope to continue seeing you throughout the week. Goodbye.